Welcome to this Friends at Home event sponsored by the Friends of the Alameda Free Library. Tonight we will be joined by Patricia Bracewell talking about the still the steel beneath the silk, the last installment of her historical fiction series about Emma of Normandy. In the year 1012, England's Norman-born Queen Emma has been 10 years wed to an aging, ruthless, haunted King Ethelred. The marriage is a bitterly unhappy one between a queen who seeks to create her own sphere of influence within the court and a suspicious king who eyes her efforts with hostility and resentment. In this breathtaking conclusion to Bracewell's Emma of Normandy trilogy, brimming with treachery, heartache, tenderness, and passion as the English queen confronts ambitious and traitorous counselors, invading armies, and the Danish king's power-hungry concubine. I am T.C. Curry from the Friends of the Alameda Library, a nonprofit organization raising funds and advocating for our outstanding public library in the beautiful city of Alameda, California. These events are free, but you will not be surprised to learn that we appreciate donations. A little later, you'll see a link for donations in the chat thread. Um, we appreciate any amount, small or large, to support these virtual events, as well as many real life programs conducted by the library. Before we get started, you should know that this is a live webinar and it is being recorded and will later be posted on YouTube. So your microphones and cameras are turned off. Please use the chat to introduce yourself, let us know where you are zooming in from, and to ask questions. We will try to get all of your we will try to get to all of your questions towards the end of the program. And we ask that you make sure to, that the chat is being used respectfully. So tonight we are joined by Patricia Bracewell, who is a local author living in Oakland and is a member of the Left Coast Writers. Her love of reading led to college degrees in literature, a career as a high school English teacher, and an unquenchable desire to write. Shadow on the Crown, the first book in her trilogy about the 11th century Queen of England, Emma of Normandy, debuted in 2013. Her second novel, The Price of Blood, was published in 2015 and continues the gripping tale of the queen whose marriage to Ethelred the Unready set in motion a series of events that would culminate in the Norman conquest of 1066. In 2014, Patricia was honored to serve as the writer-in-residence at Gladstone's Library in Wales, where she con conducted research for tonight's book, The Still Steel, ah, the Steel Beneath the Silk. First, um, this book has won first place, best in category, um, for the 2021 Chaucer Book Awards for pre-1750s historical fiction by the Chanticleer International Book Awards. So please welcome me in joining Patricia Basewell to our program. Patricia, thank you for joining us. Hi, TC. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for having me. Ah, so much our pleasure. <laughs> um, can you start by reading a passage from The Steel Beneath the Silk? I can. I have, um, I've chosen uh, a scene from the third chapter of the book. And I like this scene because it puts us in Ethelred's, King Ethelred's viewpoint. And he is seeing Emma at this time, so we're seeing Emma through his eyes. So here we go. Uh, the year is, Ju is 1012, it's June, and the setting is Rochester, Kent. King Ethelred sat at the high table in the bishop's great hall and surveyed the men and women gathered there for the Witan's closing feast. The midsummer evening was so warm that although the shutters had been flung wide to catch the breeze, the king was sweating beneath his heavy gold embroidered gown and cloak. Torches in brackets throughout the hall warded off the growing dark, and in their light, 
the halos of apostles painted larger than life upon the plastered walls glowed golden. And it seemed to Ethelred that the saints' wide eyes stared fixedly on the company gathered below them. On either side of him, Archbishop Wolstan of Jorvik and Rochester's Bishop Godwin discussed ecclesiastical matters to which Ethelred paid little heed. Instead, ever and again, his gaze was drawn to his queen. Emma was gowned in the palest silk, and the gold at her throat and wrists shimmered like the halos of the saints upon the walls. Throughout the meal, she had been moving among the guests, offering each in turn the brimming welcoming cup. What private words, he wondered. Did she murmur to each man as she placed the vessel in his hands? She had been lingering now for some time at the table where Thorkel sat with his Danish shipmen, speaking to them in their own tongue and beguiling them with her smile. He muttered half to himself, Emma lavishes her attention too fiercely upon the Danes. Bishop Godwin, interrupted in mid-sentence, followed his gaze and considered the queen. Surely, my lord, she merely performs the office of peace weaver, he observed, as any queen must. Her knowledge of the Northmen's tongue is a boon to us, is it not? Ethelred grunted. It was a boon that Emma had kept hidden even from him these ten years until it suited her to reveal it. What mm -hmm. other more damning secrets had she concealed from him? Yet his churchmen, like this bishop, were ever her staunchest defenders. What is it you fear? Archbishop Wolfstan's harsh voice grated against Ethelred's ear. That the queen is inserting herself between you and your Danish ally? She seeks to augment her influence at my court, he grumbled. It is unseemly. Wolfstan was silent for a moment before he observed, I agree that your queen reaches for power of a kind, but it is a woman's power that she would have and no threat to your own. She is readying herself for the struggle she will face one day when you and I have gone to our heavenly reward. The archbishop leaned even closer and whispered, that future is not yours to dictate, Lord King. It belongs to those who will survive you. There are other far more pressing concerns in your realm that demand your attention. Ooh, <laughs> thank you. So how did you even find Emma? I mean, I, I've never heard of her before I read your first book. Um, I've barely heard of Ethel Red the Unready. Um, and so I'm kind of fascinated as to how you stumbled across her. Well, it's true that even in England, Emma is not very well known. Um, and this was, we have to go back to the last century, to the 1990s, when I decided I wanted to write a historical novel. Mm -hmm. And I had my antenna up looking for someone to write about who was not a tutor because they had been done and done and done. Um, and I happened to be online and saw a post about this Queen of England who was the daughter of the Duke of Normandy, the sister of another Duke of Normandy, the wife of two different kings of England and the mother of two different kings of England and the great aunt of William the Conqueror. And I thought, who is this woman? Why have I never heard of her? And so I started to do more research about Emma. And the more I researched her, the more fascinated I became with this amazing woman who had such a big impact on English history. How does one go about researching a woman from the year 1000? Well, yeah, um, it's not easy. She's mentioned, you know, my book covers 15 years from 1002 until 1012, my my for my trilogy mm -hmm. until uh, actually all the way to 1017. But anyway, um, it covers about 15 years. And um, 
the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which is the contemporary history of that time, mentions her maybe three or four times in that whole period. But what I discovered about Emma after I started my research was that she had commissioned a book to be written about her uh, by um, a Flemish monk who was in her court. And she is telling part of her story, not her whole story, uh, in that book, the way that she wanted people to remember her. So that's how you go about wow. the research. So that seems really rare. I mean, you don't hear many autobiographies of any queens, honestly. It was very rare for that period. Um, Emma's mother, Gunnar, was a Danish woman. She had a Danish background and she was very interested in her Danish background and supported historians who were writing about the Danish history at the time. And I think mm. that is where Emma got the idea. And Emma's daughter-in-law then would have a book written about her family. So Emma sort of in mm. England anyway, set the tone for that. But she's the first woman that I know of that did anything like that. And that's what makes her so amazing is that she understood the power of the written word. And yeah. it's why we know who she is today. As a member of Left Coast Writers, I was lucky enough to be present for your first book launch for The Shadow of the Crown. And um, I remember in the Q&A session, um, you were talking about how Emma could read, but she could not write, which is why she you know, paid this monk, or commissioned this monk to do that. And it fascinated me because I've always thought of reading and writing as like paired um I didn't realize that it was such a different skill it but was you, very, yeah you, you said it was common back then it was yet yeah, very few people could write and if you've seen mm -hmm. any of the actual writings from that period and they're either you know they may be in Latin they may be in um um old English just this minuscule handwriting it's very difficult to read so that was a very special skill and reading was a different skill now oh I talked with a historian just the other day and she didn't think that Emma could read um, but Emma's encomium was written in Latin and Latin was the language of the church and it was the language of law mm -hmm. and I think Emma would have known my belief that she would have known Latin Frankly, I can't imagine anyone commissioning a book to be written about me that I couldn't read. So, <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> a good point. <laughs> I think probably in a lot of the day to day sort of things, Emma had a clerk. She had somebody, a priest who was at her elbow, who would read her whatever missives came because it was difficult to read those missives. Um, and that's how the encomium would have been heard at the court someone would have read it out loud and mm -hmm. because the court was made up of Danes and English and Flemish and Normans there would be someone translating that Latin for them it also makes sense because she was very concerned about power and it seems to me, and maybe this is just the way you've written her, <laughs> um, but it seems to me that someone who is that interested and was walking between these two different worlds, three different worlds, really, um, that she would find a way to learn how to read because somebody who is that interested in power wouldn't want to have this whole mysterious set of papers that she could not access. I think you're right. And in my mind, uh, Emma was not only a polyglot. We know that she spoke Norman French. We know that she probably spoke Danish. She would have learned that at her mother's knee. Mm -hmm. uh, um, she would have had to have learned Old English. She was at the court all the time um, and signing charters. So yes, I think 
power was important to her. She had children and she tried to promote her children in every way that she could. Mm -hmm. So you say on your blog that the original title of the book was Perilous, Ta Perilous Tides. Um, can you talk about why that title and why it was changed to The Steel Beneath the Silk? Well, in my mind, Perilous Tides sort of was directed towards the fact that these Danes were coming over to uh, attack England, that the tides were perilous because they were bringing mm. these Danes. And this book in particular, this third book, actually the whole trilogy is about the Danish conquest of England. Yes, it's about Emma. She's the central figure. But this Danish conquest is going on throughout the entire trilogy. And at this point, these these tides are bringing these Danes over um, and the more I thought about it, the more I thought, you know, this is not just about the Danish conquest. It is about, I wanted the title to be directed more towards Emma. So mm. Emma is, is beneath the silk. There's that steel in mm -hmm. her. And I wanted it to reference not just Emma, but all the other women in the book. And there are a number of them mm -hmm. who have to be strong through this yeah. period because sons die, husbands die. Um, it's it's a difficult time. And, and in a way, it's my homage, I suppose, to so many women who've lived through war, who are living through war and have to be strong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's something I, I mean, you hear about, you know, the 1066 number, you know, the Battle of Hastings, but reading your books made me realize it's really a 60 year process or probably even more than that. Yes. Um, leading up to that battle, that final battle. Exactly. Um, you spent a lot of time doing research in England for this novel. Um, can you talk about why that was important to you and um, maybe let us know your favorite spot that you found during your travels? Well, it was important to me um, very selfishly because I wanted to go to England. Um, <laughs> and, and I went to England many, many times. Um, and one of the first trips, research trips I made was to Cambridge University, where I took a two week course in Anglo-Saxon history. And mm -hmm. it covered the period from Alfred the Great to Edward the Confessor, which was exactly the period that I needed uh, for my book. But also, I wanted to kind of have a boots on the ground experience. I wanted to know what Normandy was like. And so I went to Normandy. I went to Denmark to see the Viking Ship Museum there and the mm -hmm. one in Oslo as well. I went to York many times, um, to Winchester. Um, you know, there are things that you see, like when I went to Exeter, and Exeter was Emma's uh, was was the gift that Emma was given as her holding when she got first got married. Mm. So we went to Exeter, and when I got there, I realized the the buildings were red, the ground the, the there was red clay, and oh. so the bricks of the buildings were red. And I would not have known that if I hadn't been there mm -hmm. and actually seen it. So mm -hmm. I think that was really important for me to go and, and do that kind of research. Um, in terms of favorite places, I have two, two favorite places. Yay. One of them, <laughs> of course, is going to be Winchester. We settled in Winchester for a while. And um, that was the royal city at the time. It's where Emma lived while she was queen, although they had several palaces that they went to. Winchester was the central heart of Anglo-Saxon England. She's buried there. Mm. And I remember going into the minster and sitting there and looking up at this high lintel where this mortuary chest was. It has bones, a number of bones from a number of people. And on it, it says, Hic Yasset Emma Regina. So Emma's bones mm. were in there. And I just sat there and looked at that for a while. So it's a beautiful city. It's a walled city. You can see part of the walls, very medieval. It has uh, marvelous bookstores and um, mm -hmm. tea shops. 
And there's even a building there called God Begot, which was Emma's own building. She lived in that building um, wow. for, for a time after after her husbands were both dead and she sort of retired. That's where she went to Winchester. So Winchester is always one of my favorite places. Wow. And the other one is um, the Rollwright Stones. So I'll be reading to you from the opening and you've read it before I know the opening to the first book shadow on the crown and it's set in this circle of stones that actually exists and it's very different from going to Winchester or from going even to any um oh you know if you go to Stonehenge it this it's kind of a circus now at Stonehenge but if you go to the Rollwright stones I mean we literally drove past it the first time when we went <laughs> we had to circle back to find it and it was empty. There was nobody there. It was just us. And I was mm. able to see it um, and imagine what it would have been like in Emma's time. Take away the, the there was a fence around it. Take away the fence and take away the road and imagine what that would have looked like uh, during Emma's time when mm. I set scenes in that particular pit, place. So, mm. yeah, the roll right stones. Did you know that this was going to be a trilogy when you started out or at what point was that decision made? I absolutely knew it was going to be a trilogy because I knew I wanted to be very close to Emma, but I also knew that people didn't know about this period of history and mm -hmm. that I was going to have to do, I was going to have to build that world and bring them into that world. And it was going to take time for each book. And each book is literally a standalone so you could mm -hmm. read the first book and it has a good ending tells that part of emma's life second book beginning middle ending tells that part of emma's life it's same with the third book Altogether, they tell a story that's that emma didn't tell and that takes me back to the to emma's encomium because emma emma's encomium does not start with her first marriage when she first comes to england it starts when Knut and Sven uh, conquer England and Emma enters the story in the middle of the book when she oh. marries Knut. And so there's a whole 17 year period that Emma does not talk about. Oh, and I wanted to write the trilogy that would, would cover the years about which Emma was silent. Can you, for those of us uh, in the audience who don't know this period, can you give us like a high level overview? Because you said that she was married to two kings and she was the mother of two kings. And so she starts out married to Ethelred and um, stays married to him through these, through this entire trilogy. But then what happens? Well, she has two sons and a daughter by Ethelred. Um, and in the year 1013, Sven Forkbeard of Denmark finally conquers England. And um, Emma and the royal family has to leave England and they go to Normandy. And they don't know how long they're going to be there. This all happens in book three. So I'm giving mm. away the story. <laughs> um, but Sven dies after like two months. After two months, he dies, and they all come back. And um, and then they drive out the Danes that were there, and then Knut comes back with another army. And right around that time, Ethelred dies in his bed. He doesn't he doesn't die in battle or anything. And his the son who is now his eldest son, Edmund Ironside, is made king. Mm. And he fights Knut for a full year uh, and finally there's a big battle at Assenden and it's kind of a draw but the well it isn't a draw actually the Danes win and um, and Edmund and Knut divide England in half Knut takes the north Edmund takes the south and then two months later Edmund dies and now King Knut is king over all of England and the first thing he does is he marries Emma. Ah, thank you. Uh, because 
this is like I said, this is not like known history particularly. <laughs> um, oh, and just as a side note, um, in terms of the quality of your research, one of the things that I remember from your first book was I was looking through um, reviews. And so there were these this medieval, or not even medieval, but like dark ages scholar who said, um, normally I complain about historical accuracy, but honestly, I was a little bit bored because I knew what was gonna happen next. <laughs> And I just, I mean, obviously this is all these years later and I'm still sort of stunned at the um, backhandedness of that compliment. Um, but I mean, you did a massive amount of research on this it, for this book in terms of just historically what happened. Um, but how I wanna to turn to the characters because your characters are so robust and we got a flavor of it with you, the reading that you did. Um, but as an as author of historic, uh, historical fiction, I mean, these characters live at some point, you know, and when, I mean, I wrote a book of fiction, I can make up whatever I want because I have no constraints. But as a historical fiction author, you have some constraints, but you also don't really know a whole lot. So I'm just kind of um, wondering how you make decisions about like who they're going to be and their character flaws and um, how to create these characters which you do with all of the characters I mean it's not just Emma is well drawn I mean they're all very intriguing and very robust but you are constrained by the time period so can you talk a little bit about that well you know good news bad news that we know very little um, about any of these people um which is great for a fiction writer because then you get to make up what you don't know. Right. But at the same time, we know enough to get a feel for who they might've been, what they might've been like. For example, Ethelred, um, we know that he was, he was kind of, uh, well, there's a quote from uh, William of Malmesbury, who was writing uh, in the 12th century. So he was writing 100 years later. And he said uh, that Ethelred was haunted by the shade of his brother, demanding terribly the price of blood. So mm -hmm. we know that Ethelred was king because his brother had been murdered. Um, and so there are stories that come down to us about how Ethelred witnessed that murder and what he thought about it, and that it basically put a shadow over his whole reign. Mm -hmm. And he does things sometimes that I I would scratch my head and say, why did you do that? And so it was a good thing to have a ghost to give him who kind of pushes <laughs> in, into doing things that one would not normally do. Um, hmm. So, and we have people like Edrich Striona, who is the villain, uh, throughout the trilogy and he is basically considered one of the worst villains of Anglo-Saxon England so mm -hmm. that helped me figure out what he was going to be like um Ethelred's son Athelstan uh is his eldest son and I wanted to make him um a love interest for Emma because I knew she wasn't going to be in love with Ethelred and there had to be a love interest somewhere if you want a mm -hmm. book published you need a little bit of a love story and i I always ask myself when I made a decision like that, could it have happened? Mm. Doesn't necessarily mean that it did happen, but could it have happened? Mm. And about Athelstan, we have his will. Oh. We actually have his written will. So we know what kind of uh, things he owned, the property, he owned properties all over England. So you get a feel for that he was wealthy. And it gave me an opportunity to tell a story about a man, the king, and his younger, his eldest son, who's now an adult, and who's, you know, that that sort of tension between the son and the father, the father who's holding on to power, and the son who wants power. Uh, so all of that 
plays into how you imagine these people. And for mm-hmm. each character, I had sort of a rap sheet. You know, mm-hmm. I I thought about what they looked like, what they sounded like, what they wanted, who they loved, who they hated, why mm-hmm. they um, did the kinds of things that if they were in a bad place, what would they do? Mm-hmm. So that was true. And, and I use that a lot. That's why it took me so long to write the books, because <laughs> there was so much prep work that was done mm-hmm. so that when I was actually writing a scene, I could go back to that and say, oh, yeah, he would do this in this situation. Right. So, And his son was already an adult when he married Emma. And Emma was how old when she got married? Like 15? Well, in my books, she's 15. We don't mm-hmm. know when she was born. We know when she died, but we don't know when she was born. And she could have been anywhere from 12 to 20. And I chose 15. And that's usually 985 is usually what's given as the birth date for her. And her, the three eldest stepsons that she had would have been right around that same age. So they were all right there together. Yeah, that makes more sense. Um, this series is focused on Emma, but, um, Elgiva, 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 Elgiva is the first person to actually make an appearance, um, in the books, um, and in the prologue of the first book. And she has a parallel life in a lot of ways, um, to Emma as a woman of royal blood. She was, you know, thinking of marrying Ethelred as the books open and goes in like a totally different way. And um, when in the research did you find her and decide to pull her into the story? I found her in the research very early on because in Emma's encomium, a woman is mentioned who was Knut's first wife. Hmm. Um, and But she doesn't appear in the historical record, uh, the encomium would have been written when Emma was quite a bit older, when Emma was in her 50s, say, -hmm. in the year 1043. Um, We first see Elgiva in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle in the year 1035, after Canute dies. Mm -hmm. And she has a son by Canute. And she is promoting her son to be Canute's heir as Mm -hmm. king of England while Emma is promoting her son by Canute to be heir to the throne of England. So I knew that even though I'm writing in the year 1002, I knew that some 32 years later, these two women were going to be at loggerheads against Mm -hmm. each other. So I wanted to have that tension between the two women right at the very beginning. So again, it was one of those situations where we don't know that Ethelred, that that Elgiva was Ethelred's mistress, which is where I, where I put her in mm-hmm. Shadow on the Crown. We know that Ethelred had mistresses. That's what some of the historians say. Uh, but the question was, in my mind, could this have happened? Mm-hmm. And so I thought, sure, um, why not? Mm. Do you have a favorite character or a couple of favorite characters to write? (laughs) And I think that also, was there any character that sort of surprised you after you started writing? Well, you know, I've been living with Emma and Elgiva since um, about 2007. So (laughs) for (laughs) about 17 years, and I'm still living with them, believe it or not. So I would have to say that those two are my favorite are my favorite characters. I like to write Emma because I think she's a better person than I am. And I like to write Elgiva because I think she's worse. So, (laughs) (laughs) and they're two sides of the same coin in some ways. Um, Did any of the characters surprise me? Gosh, uh, That's a that's a tough question. I don't I don't know. Um, well, I'll let you think about it for a minute. But yeah. um, my other question, and this wasn't on my list, but um, you know, it the series opens, and you'll read 
from this where they go visit a wise woman. And I love the mystical part of this, not just the ghost, but, you know, they go to fortune tellers and the fortune tellers tell them things that they get excited about and it happens, but it's completely not what they were thinking. And I'm wondering, how do you research something like that? <laughs> <laughs> well, you make up a lot of it. Yeah. But we do have um, we do have a letter, a sermon, actually, from Archbishop Wolfstown. I mentioned he was mentioned mm -hmm. in that first reading that I did. And he wrote in that sermon about he was kind of castigating the Anglo-Saxons saying, you know, we've got all these Danes coming over and it's our fault because we've got people who go see fortune tellers. Yeah. Um, so you know that that sort of thing is going on in England, that there are pockets of the old religions. The Danes were only barely Christianized, right? Mm -hmm. They were still, a lot of them were still following Woden and, and, um, and his pan panoply of guards, right. uh, of gods. So that's how you go about that. And I, I went into, I have a couple of books on the Norse gods and the North Norse religions to see, you know, what those were like and get some of the language of that, some of the, um, the characters, uh, what they would have done. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, it was in 10, I, not 10, 2012, I think, that, you know, I talked about the, the Rollwright stones. They mm -hmm. they dug up a grave near the Rollwright stones, just mm -hmm. right there, mm -hmm. that they believe was of a woman, oh, they think it was 6th century, uh, who would have been a seeress mm -hmm. uh, because of the things that they found in the grave. Mm -hmm. So I, I thought that was pretty amazing that I sort of put her there and then they found somebody who was actually exactly what I thought. Wow, that's great. So um, you're talking about this as a trilogy, but it ends pretty early in Emma's life. And so are you done with Emma? <laughs> well, my idea was that this book would end where Emma's encomium starts. Mm. And that's what I did. The trilogy would end where the encomium begins. And since that, since I finished the trilogy and I thought, I thought I was done. Mm -hmm. um, there's been enough interest in it that I thought, okay, I'm going to go all the way here. I'm going to go ahead and write a fourth book. So I will have written a trilogy and a sequel, <laughs> a fourth <laughs> book that now is going to cover that whole period that is covered by the encomium. Because there are things about the encomium that historians argue about. Um, there are things that are that we're not certain about how they happened, mm -hmm. even though it's written in the encomium. It's like, well, okay, but but what's the story behind this particular event? It's very dramatic. The things that happened in the second half of Emma's life are hugely dramatic. Um, People want to know, well, what was it like while Emma was Knut's queen? Because that was really, she was much more powerful as Knut's queen than she was as Ethelred's queen. Mm. But the history that we have is all about everything that Knut was doing. He was going to Rome. He was having battles in Norway and in Denmark. And doesn't tell any, you know, basically being a queen is kind of boring. So <laughs> it's, it's only after he dies that things get really dicey again. And so, <laughs> so I want to, you know, sort of begin that I don't begin. I do talk about Emma being, being the queen under Canute, but um, it's that later period of her life that is really, really interesting. Ooh, something to look forward to. <laughs> It'll take me a while. Don't hold your breath, anybody, because <laughs> this is going to take a long time. Because it's going to cover, you know, the whole trilogy covered like 17 years. This is going to cover 25 years in one book. So wow. we're going to do a lot of skipping time. 
<laughs> are you, yeah, I'll bet. Um, unless it sort of expands itself into like <laughs> no, a more that's trilogy. not going to happen. No, 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 no. <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit about the process of selling the book? Like moving over into the author, you know, the business side of things. Um, how long did it take you to find an agent? Um, what was the process after you found an agent? How long did that take? Well, we're talking now about the very first book, right? Yeah. It's not, um, and uh, I went to a conference, a historical novel society conference that was held outside of Chicago. And I pitched the book to two agents. They both wanted to see samples of my work, which I sent. And one of them wanted to see the whole book. By that time, I had a whole book. Mm -hmm. And over the course of about three or four months, I got the, the book to her and she read it and uh, decided to take me on and um, made some suggestions for a few changes, which I did. And, uh, and then she started to try to sell the book and that took two years after at the end of two years she wow. came back to me and she said we're having trouble I've given it to some other people at at the um at, at where she where she was um mm -hmm. and they made suggestions they said we want more ghost we <laughs> want you to change the title cut the title was called royal hostage we mm -hmm. want you to change the title and um and so I did that and um, she sold it like in two weeks because, because Game of Thrones had just come on TV. Wow. And, and my agent said that changed the landscape for historical fiction. They were looking for something medievally and dark. And they saw this as kind of a Game of Thrones without dragons. So. <laughs> <laughs> Nuts. Um, more ghosts, but no, no dragon. No dragon, right. <laughs> and I thought people are going to get really sick of this ghost. And I, it was tough. And if anyone surprised me, it was the ghost because I always had to figure out a way. He never says anything, but I had to make him <laughs> appear different every time. He was oh. never, I never, you know, you don't want to do the same thing every time. Just like you don't want to have every woman die in childbirth, right? You have to come up with different ways to kill people off different ways that Ethelred sees this ghost. Mm. Um, so, Interesting. Over books, it was tough. <laughs> so we've got a question. Um, and it seems like there are similarities between strong women um, in that age and beyond um, and thinking of Eleanor of Aquitaine. Um, is she next for your research? I guess, Eleanor of Aquitaine. But um, talk a little bit, before you answer that question, talk a little bit about what in Normandy, because I was thinking about that, you know, being a real big fan of Lion in Winter. It was like, oh, Emma of Normandy, she's from Normandy. And, you know, Eleanor of Aquitaine is from Normandy. And what is it about Normandy? <laughs> well, Eleanor of Aquitaine is actually far south in Aquitaine, which is ah. not Normandy. Um, but all the English kings for many, many years um, were were dukes of Normandy um, mm. at the same time as they were kings of England, because William the Conqueror was the Duke of Normandy, and then he came over and conquered England. So there's all that going on. But I don't think that, uh, you know, Eleanor, Eleanor was amazing. And um, like Emma, you know, I think... It, I think these were women who were raised to be royals. They were raised to be powerful women. And I think that is what happened with both of them. Um, yeah, I don't know what else I can say about that, that they, they, they were raised within the halls of power. And mm -hmm. so certainly with Emma, she saw her mother being an active, ruler she was behind her husband and she and when her husband died she was the support of her son as 
Duke of Normandy. And the Dukes of Normandy were wealthier than the King of France. So, wow. so you know, even though they supposedly were supposed to answer to the King of France, they were much more powerful than the mm -hmm. French King for many, many, many decades. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Ugh, I love history. So, um, uh, let me just check the chat and see if I'm missing any uh, questions. If anybody has any questions, um, now is the time. Um, I would love for you to end with the prologue from Shadow in the Crown. So this is how the entire series starts. Happy to do that. I happen to have a book right here. Mm. So this is the prolo prologue. It is the eve of St. Hilda's Feast, November 1001, near Saltford, Oxfordshire. She made a circuit of the clearing among the oaks, three times round and three times back, whispering spells of protection. There had been a portent in the night. A curtain of red light had shimmered and danced across the midnight sky like scarlet silk flung against the stars. Once in the year before her birth, such a light had marked a royal death. Now it surely marked another. And although her magic could not banish death, she wove the spells to ward disaster from the realm. When her task was done, she fed the fire that burned in the center of the ancient stone ring. And sitting down beside it, she waited for the one who came in search of prophecy. Before the sun had moved a finger's width across the sky, the figure of a woman, cloaked and veiled, stood atop the rise, her hand upon the sentinel stone. Slowly, she followed the path down through the trees and into the giant's dance until she, too, took her place beside the fire with silver in her palm. I would know my lady's fate, she said. The silver went from hand to hand, and against her will, the seer glimpsed a heart broken and barren that loved with a dark and twisted love. But the silver had been given, and at her nod, a lock of hair was laid upon the flames. She searched for visions in the fire, and they tumbled and roiled until they hurt her eyes and scored her heart. Your lady will be bound to a mighty lord, she said at last, and her children will be kings. But because of the darkness in that heart across the fire, she said nothing of the other, of the lady who would journey from afar, and of the two life threads so knotted and tangled that they could not be pulled asunder for a lifetime or forever. She did not speak of the green land that would burn to ash in the days to come, or of the innocents who would die all for the price of a throne. There would be portents in the sky again tonight, she knew, and high above her the stars would weep blood. Wow. <laughs> oh. So many thanks to you, Patricia, for that reading um, and just a really enjoyable conversation. You're so welcome and thank you for having me. It was good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to see you. Um, in closing, I want to remind folks that The Steel Beneath the Silk is available locally at Books, Inc. And of course, everywhere fine books are sold. Also the library, of course. Although her first two books are now out of print, you can purchase hard copies on resale book sites and digital copies on all major audio and ebook platforms. A reminder to consider a donation to the Friends of the Alameda Free Library at alamedafriends.com or through the link posted in the chat. This will help us continue to produce events like this one. 
Also, if you have a friend who missed this talk, you can tell them it will, will be available on YouTube in the next few days. They can check the alamedafriends.com website for a link. Our next Friends at Home event will be when we will be talking with Amanda Peters about her novel, The Berry Pickers. A four-year-old Mikamak girl goes missing from the blueberry fields of Maine sparking a mystery that will haunt the survivors, unravel a family, and remain unsolved for nearly 50 years. Join us on Wednesday, April 3rd at 5 p.m. We're doing it early because Amanda is on the East Coast. Um, so join us for this conversation. I would like to thank the team that makes these events happen, Karen Manuel, Serena Hom, Karen Butter, and Billy Reinschmidt. And a special thank you again to Patricia for an informative and entertaining program. And finally, thanks to all of you for joining us this evening.